Today's episode is sponsored by Future State Media, experts in off Amazon traffic for Amazon sellers. Future State Media will build you a custom made website to deliver sales for you on Amazon. Built to grab traffic from search engines and social media, your site can be used as a secret weapon for launching products on Amazon or just to stabilize your Amazon sales. It means you can also build an email list on autopilot. Go to futurestatemedia.com for your free guide to Google SEO for Amazon sellers today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. This is your host, Michael Vizi, with more wonderful knowledge for advanced or at least um, moving Amazon sellers. This show is focused on those who already have revenue and um, know how to do the basics and want to grow and are ambitious. And one of the things you need to do is money because this is an in inventory based business and that means it's capital intensive. And there's um, many, many discussions that I've had at the 10K Collective Mastermind where one of the major topics is how do I get more money to fund my business? So the man to deal with that is Bruce Mack of Platinum Financing Group. Uh, Platinum Finance is a financial consulting company that primarily finds uh, clients. And Bruce has a huge background in this stuff. He's a financial advisor. He's a speaker, a trainer. He was even a banker in his past life. So uh, incredibly qualified to talk on the subject. So Bruce, warm, warm welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Michael. I really appreciate the, uh, being invited to your show and uh, look forward to chatting with uh, all the folks that are on the uh, podcast and what have you and give them some great information that they can take to the bank. Pardon the pun. <laughs> uh, oh dear, bad puns already. It's that kind of show. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Yeah, well, I like bad puns. It's good. I like it. So, Bruce, tell us a bit more about yourself. I mean, I know you were just sharing with me that you've just been skiing and uh, you, you had a bit of a sports injury, but of less than an exciting kind. So, in your amount of action, tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background. Give oh. us a bit of a fuller figure for Bruce the man as well as the financier. Okay, so, so now you're already starting. I think we're into this now for what, 20 seconds and you're embarrassing me. I'm already probably turning red in the face. So I was telling, I was telling Michael, he said, how's things going? I said, well, I said, to be honest with you, my, I think you call it a bum, right? My, my, my bum is killing me and uh, so is my, my left hand. I, I used to teach and uh, race I love to snow ski and it's my passion. I mean, every, you know, we, we all do it for a reason. And my reason or my why is to be able to take a day and cut work and live, live the laptop lifestyle and go and do and be where I want to be. And where I want to be when there's snow is up in the mountains skiing. So I was up at a place called Mammoth Lakes, uh, California. It's about five, five and a half hours from, uh, Los Angeles and the mountain is fantastic and they just had over three feet of fresh new snow and I wanted to time it right and timing it right meant after one storm and before this next storm coming in and that meant I go up on Saturday and I ski Sunday and Monday and beat it back uh, to the office by uh, only cutting work for one day. So I'm up there and I'm having a good time and I'm not falling, I'm just, you know, everything's good. I'm, I'm walking right back to the car, I'm in the parking lot, I see that car, I'm 10 feet away from the car, and the next thing I see is I see my feet going right over my head. <laughs> there was, good, good stop. The, the parking lot was a sheet of ice, and I fell on my arse. <laughs> You fell in your bum. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I suppose, yeah, we do say that. So <laughs> getting back to the point there, so you're obviously you know, a man of great action. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> some of the action in the car park, less than exciting. But I love the fact that you're a very physical, entrepreneurial. People are, are often like that. It seems they're very sporty and very goal-oriented in their hobbies as well. A lot of other people that I know to be massively into cars and car racing, drag racing, whatever it is. So, um, yeah, fantastic to, to meet somebody who's got some passion for life outside of finance. But so tell us a little bit more about the, the whole topic of finance. So the first thing is to say that um, it's a big, big uh, need that I come across repeatedly. And the bigger the sellers, ironically, the bigger the need for money, because uh, a lot of people miss that at the beginning stages. They think, oh, the better my business is, um, the less money I'm going to need. And sure, that can work that way. But tell us a little bit about your experience, first of all, working with e-commerce sellers or, or physical product sellers generally. How does that need for funding manifest itself? Well, that's a, that's a great question, Michael. Um, I've been in, in, in the financing arena for uh, decades and worked with countless thousands of people, helping them 
uh, either with startup capital, uh, capitalization needs, and or existing uh, businesses with cash infusion so that they can take their business to the next level. Uh, we work with a lot of different verticals, but a couple of the verticals that we found to be that are big niches that we've been able to uh, be extremely successful with that particular type of individual has been uh, real estate investors because there's an ongoing and chronic need uh, uh, for money for people that are doing foreclosures, for people that are acquiring properties, for people that are, you know, they just always seem to need a lot of money. Another major market niche that we've been extremely successful with is working with FBA uh, types of folks, people that are in your space, people that are uh, buying and selling on Amazon and, uh, and or eBay or what have you, because the interesting part is that I keep getting told from the students that we work with is when you find and you're able to mine out, data mine out, what have you, a winner, uh, one that, you know, an object that is clicking uh, and that you may want to take an offshore it or what have you, it's how quickly can you get your, your product to market and how can you get as many of those widgets, gadgets, or gadgets that you can get and warehouse them so you can send them out. And if you can't get those widgets, gadgets, and gadgets in the warehouse to be able to send out, then that's lost opportunity cost. Uh, and, and it's an unfortunate thing because the, the FBA world moves so quickly that you need to be able to capitalize on them as, as quickly as possible. And that's one of the things that cash and cash infusion can make such a focal difference in is to be able to get the inventory that's required so that you can make the sales so that you can make those great margins. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you put your finger on the, the key word that I heard from that is opportunity cost. I think that's one of the things that when people go out of stock on Amazon, and one of the reasons they might go out of stock is undercapitalization because, you know, there's a few reasons they may not have predicted demand, etc. But often people are um, stingy, if you like, they're, they're cautious with the amount of inventory they stock because of a lack of cash. And thus they miss out on out of stock. And if you're out of stock on something that's selling um, $10,000 a month, and, and that's quite small for the Q4 in, in um, Amazon.com in America, certainly, then, you know, if you're out of stock for three months, that's $30,000 of uh, lost sales, plus all the lost ranking, or the lost reviews you could have been gaining. In the meantime, your competition is doing all the rest. So 100%, I mean, th this is a major, major, major block to a lot of people. Um, so yeah, I think you've got your hand, your finger on the pulse very much with that. Let's get into some details. And first of all, let's deal with the question because um, a lot of people listen to the podcast. Um, uh, this is a new venture. So I imagine if it reflects the amazing FBA podcast. And by the way, this is kind of a blend because I won't want people to know um, to completely run away from amazing FBA. It's still me. It's still the same kind of set of contacts, but the focus is different for 10K Collective. But we don't know, but I imagine it'll be a lot of Americans listening and a lot of Brits. So let's differentiate between what the things you can, your, you and your company can help with Brits with and the, the topics you know about. First of all, can UK-based individuals get funding at all in America if they're wanting to expand their FBA businesses there? Oh, okay. Um, the answer is yes, we do have a program for uh, Brits, as you put it, uh, uh, that, that uh, would like to uh, be getting money uh, uh, to drive their business forward. We have uh, a corporate credit program for individuals, uh, and they can they can live in Britain, be uh, and and continue their business in Britain. And there's a little there's a little twist to that. Uh, the twist would be that they would. Uh, they would establish a business, which is very inexpensive, establish a business in the United States, uh, and then we can get them, uh, we can get them credit. We can get them, generally speaking, well, our guarantee is to get them a minimum of $50,000 worth of uh, credit, and that's a minimum guarantee. I've seen in many cases us getting 100, 150 or more for individuals. And the reason that we can do it is once they have established a business, we can use that as a threshold to begin to getting open lines of uh, what's called trade line credit and then build upon that 
until we get other types of credit so that they can use that, that type of credit for open to buy. Uh, matter of fact, we even, one of the, one of the um, interesting, one of the uh, uh, clients that we get uh, people credit with is actually with Amazon. So that's interesting as, as we go through the credit building process with uh, uh, individuals. So the credit can be used anywhere in the world. It's strictly uh, a, a simple scenario of establishing a business domestically uh, to be able to start to do the credit building process. And it has nothing to do with what's called here in the United States, one's FICO uh, score, which is their Fair Isaac score, which is their credit score. And it also has nothing to do with their social security number. Um, so it is totally strictly based on their EIN, which is their employer identification number and how we go about building that type of credit from ground zero. Wow. Okay. Interesting. So let me just reflect a few, a few things back. I'm just, I've grabbed a pen yeah. and started making notes on a notepad here. Cause I was thinking I was trying to focus on the interview and not be fiddling around with notes, but I know that I've got to get my head around this and that helps my listeners to get their head around it as well. So first of all, trade line credit. Um, yeah. So that's bas let me just check one thing first, because this is obviously a critical distinction between different flavors of debt. Is that dependent on putting your, your personal property, like your house, um, as collateral, because obviously that can be one of the big things that makes a difference to a loan. Sure. And, and that's a great question. People oftentimes ask me, they say, well, um, is the credit that you get for your folks secured or is it, or is it unsecured? The types of credit that we're going to be focusing on for today's call are all going to be what's considered to be unsecured, meaning no security pledge, meaning no collateralization and or cross collateralization. Everything is done on a signature and that's the only way uh, that, uh, that, that we would be discussing or that's the only type of, I should say, credit that we're discussing and or funding uh, availability. Uh, nothing to do, nothing to do with any type of collateralization. Yeah, because I mean, obviously it's going to be a lot harder for anyone to police that and if they've got UK-based residents and they had to personally come over and, and repossess their personal property, that could get tricky. So yeah, interesting. I mean, that's certainly music to people's ears and normally a loan, in my experience with, uh, you know, with most of the 10K collective members or people of that ilk, if they're going to make a, a substantial loan over, say, $100,000, it tends to be collateralized. Although I, what, I must just double check, what is cross-collateralization? That sounds like a terrible disease. <laughs> what is that in real life? Well, you never would want to catch cross collateralization because it spreads, right? It, it's what, infectious. No. What does it mean in English, in normal words? In, in, in English, cross collateralization means, well, let's just talk about it from a real estate uh, perspective. This will be a good example. Let's just say I want to buy a property. And I've been <clears throat> told that not only do I have to have good credit, but I have to cross collateralize or pledge, sign a note saying that in the event that I do not make payment on the new property that I'm getting funding for, that you are given the right to take one or more of my other properties that I currently own. So that's using collateral as a way to securitize the credit that's being given to you. And this could be other things other than real property. I've seen cross collateralization work with uh, things like uh, people's jewelry uh, collections, um, stocks, bonds, and other types of uh, equities and or valuable items. So it doesn't necessarily need to be, be property, but in most cases, it usually does mean property. Okay, interesting. Right. Yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. So it's another way basically of it's security for the bank, but not for us as the, the, the lens. Exactly. The lens. So, okay, that sounds like good news. So to summarize, then you can probably lend a Brit at least 50,000. I say Brit, and I know what to call people, UK based people. I mean, you know, whatever the right word is, people in the UK. I mean, they're going to be um, able to get at $50,000, possibly more, 100, maybe even 150,000 yeah. unsecured funding. Um, based on a trade line credit. So just to clarify, what is um, trade line? Because I think one of the things I want to get from an expert like yourself is, is to get people 
um, an overview of, of the terminology that they need to understand, you know, your perspective as a lending person and to start to speak the language and know the different nuances. So what is a trade line as opposed to, say, um, a line of credit? Presumably it's a, sp a special type of a line of credit. And how is that different from, say, a credit card? Okay, well, let's start off with uh, talking about the the uh, program that that uh, I started to jump into, uh, which is the corporate credit program. Uh, the basis or ground level type of credit that folks are getting are trade lines. Uh, companies uh, that are here in America, su such as, um, oh, let's just take uh, Uline. They're an office supplies company. And they will uh, pretty much open up anybody who can fog a mirror if they have the right credentials, which of course we help people get the right credentials, and they will be given several hundred dollars worth of credit. And a client, which we teach well, when they're assigned out to one of our coaching staff, they're, they're taught to make a, uh, some minimal purchases and of course, to make payments on those because what ultimately is going to happen is that the person is going to start to increase what's called their paydex, which is their Dun & Bradstreet and IntelliScore, which is from uh, Experian. Those scores are going to increase over a period of time based upon their payment track record. Uh, so when they get their open to buy, they make a purchase, and then they pay on that purchase. And they pay on that purchase within the first 10 days of receiving that notification. Now that's critical because these corporate credit uh, companies look to see when you pay. With a credit card, you don't get anything good or bad happening if you pay your credit card bill when you first get it. Uh, Actually, the only thing that happens that's bad is if you pay, uh, make your payment on a 30-day payment uh, in, after 30 days, then you get hit with a derogatory because you have a 30-day late, but you get no reward for paying early. That's just not the case with corporate credit. They actually have a tool that measures that if you uh, make your payment within the first 10 days of the invoice, on a net 30 basis uh, pay, you actually get the credit in that case of being what's called and rated as a prompt pay, as opposed to the next bracket, which is that 10 to 30 days, which is a paid on time, and then the last bracket, which is a late pay. So we teach everybody to be a prompt pay. You get extra kudos for being an early uh, uh, or prompt payer. And that's a good thing. We show you how to uh, take these trade lines and stack them and over a period of several months and, re and, and repeated uh, making minimal purchases, you then move up to the second level, the second level being things such as um, uh, store cards for places like, which you, um, oh gosh, um, places such as Amazon where you can buy anything and uh, you'll be getting a, a, a multi-thousand dollar open to buy. Um, and this is a, a great thing to help you ascend towards getting the final goal. And the final goal is to be able to get credit cards that are $2,500, $5,000, $10,000 credit cards or more. And this is where you're at the highest level and then you can be utilizing uh, those cards for making ton, for making inventory purchases to fuel and push and move your business forward at, at a rapid pace. Wow, now that, okay. that, that program is totally different from a couple of other programs, which I'm delighted to share with you if you want me to, Michael, but those other programs are really for uh, domestic based people because they do need to have a FICO, they also, uh, a, and uh, a social security number for those other programs, though those, okay. though those programs are extremely powerful to that audience.
Great. Well, let's address that. We definitely, definitely want to address that. But let's just draw together what you've just been talking about and let me reflect as a sort of, I suppose, informed amateur. Um, I'm certainly no professional in, in credit, but just to make sure that we've understood and give people a chance to absorb this. So basically, we've been talking about corporate credit program, which applies mm -hmm. to companies based in the US and the people who own those companies can be based in the UK or the US or anywhere else. Is that a fair summary? Yes, but many of the, the, the many of the corporate credit building blocks, uh, those trade lines, are domestic companies. But some of these companies that uh, people will be getting credit with are international in scope. Um, so it, it really depends. It really depends, and that's one of the reasons that we have been successful with people that are uh, foreign uh, foreign nationals that uh, want to get going with corporate credit. Right. Okay. Well, so that's, in other words, it's going to be a, a worth getting in touch, if in doubt, get in touch with, with you guys or, or a similar um, type of, of, of service. I mean, obviously, you guys know masses about this stuff. Um, but just to, to um, summarize, there are basically three types of credit. There's the corporates, um, trade lines, and it's really critical and very, very helpful information to, to know how they get classified by these um, lending lending companies. So basically, you pay within 10 days, you pay within 30 days, or if, if that's what you've agreed as your payment term, or you're late. And so it's good to know that you get rewarded for early payment. And then the next level up is, is um, the store cards and things like that, and then credit cards, which is by the sound of it much more flexible because you can pay up to the, the the latest payment date without any penalty. So that's a kind of summary in my understanding. Is that accurate? Is there anything to, to tweak of that? Well, again, no, I'd, I'd say that you're really spot on. I mean, with credit cards, you've got a 30 day basis uh, open uh, to, to make payment. Uh, and with corporate credit, though you can take up to 30 days as you're trying to establish your credit, our, and, and, and these are invoiced, um, bills that have a what's called uh, net 30 basis, meaning you have to pay it within 30 days. Uh, it's not a revolving line of credit like a like a uh, credit card is. Mm. So uh, again, we just caution people as part of the training process that you want to put your best foot forward so you get the highest and quickest possible positive ratings. And one of the ways is to, you, I tell people, you get you 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 get an invoice. You pay the invoice. It's that simple. Yeah. Then yeah, that exactly. way it doesn't. It, that way it just doesn't go into the standard payment, and certainly not doesn't slip into being a late payment. Yeah, interesting. So in a way, what it reminds you of as an Amazon seller is that basically in order to make profit down the line um, on Amazon, we need to feed the algorithm that Amazon has. And everything's driven by an algorithm, right, these days with the odd human intervention occasionally. But um, I know from my conversations with friends of mine who've worked in the financial sector in the UK, that um, basically most of the decisions are made by a credit score or some equivalent uh, process. So basically you're feeding the algorithm as an Amazon seller to try and get Amazon to rank your products. And then over time, while they, when they do that, then gradually you can dec you know, increase the price Price and stop spending so aggressively on app and Amazon um, ads or whatever your traffic source is. And it feels like a similar process to me. I mean, this is less familiar to most Amazon sellers, but it's, it feels like the first thing to do is to please the algorithm. At this case, it's the lenders build um, a profile that says, yes, this is a good person to lend to. Um, and then gradually over time, then we can start to make that pay off in a more serious way. So that, that's my um, Amazon seller centric understanding of, of the, you know, making coming back to a familiar process for us. So very interesting. I, I totally, totally agreed, Michael. Actually, the the uh, and, and to add to what you're saying, there's a ranking, just like you said, and it starts off at zero, and zero is just as zero does. It's zero, <laughs> and then 100, uh, being at the pinnacle or at the top, uh, uh, being the ultimate best ranking that you can get, um, and anything that's an 80, 80 or above is a very solid ranking and that's what we're working for and that's what we're working towards is working with the client to get them an 80 paid x and intellascore or better uh ranking in as few months as possible so that they are going to have more credit offered to them excellent well i mean i think what's interesting to me is that i meet i meet amazon sellers obviously i meet people at all levels those who wish to sell and those who are, you know the million pound mastermind i guess 
that would be a couple of people are doing, say, $6 million, um, $7 million a year equivalent. So not vast businesses by the wider scheme of things. But um, it, what's interesting is that they're normally very patient about being willing to spend a lot of uh, money and effort just to rank for um, keywords for products because they know the value of that over time. And I guess what we need to educate ourselves on is the value of credit over time and thus to, to have the similar level of patience to build that rather than just banging on the door of the bank and kind of hoping. So, which seems to be the strategy that even some reasonably robust sellers use. So this is more sophisticated strategy. It makes a lot of sense. So listen, let's move over to what you were calling the domestic. Um, if you're US based, that would be you. Or if you're UK based, that would mean US based people. Um, because I know you have some other programs that you educate people in there. So tell us a little bit more about what's available to those folks. Well, we've got several other programs that depending upon who the individual is, might be a perfect fit. So let me start with, if I may, our revolving lines of credit program. And our revolving lines of credit program has a really, really great tagline. Our tagline is 0% APR, that's annual percentage rate paid, 0% APR for up to 21 months on that program if you qualify. And qualifying um, is really not that difficult. If somebody's got a 700 or better FICO score, and ideally they have at least one or more credit cards that has a $5,000 credit limit, and currently their utilization on their credit cards and their store cards is at 30% or less on each of their cards, likely they're qualified to go through that program. Um, now, somebody might say, well, you know, I'm not there. I have a 620. I have a 630 FICO score. Darn it. Well, don't despair. You'll still want to see if we can get you to qualify because there, there are some if, buts, and exceptions with that. Let me give you uh, the, some of the if and the buts. We actually have uh, an external funding department to pay down people's high utilization cards so that they get their FICO scores to go north or, or increase. So FICO penalizes people greatly a third of your entire FICO score is derived from credit utilization. And once you start creeping over the imaginary brick wall, and that imaginary brick wall is at 30% utilization, once you start creeping over that imaginary brick wall, unfortunately, FICO starts to penalize you and your credit scores start to erode. So imagine, uh, let me give you an example. Imagine, first of all, that you've got a $10,000 credit card, credit limit. And let's just say that you bought a lot of product. <laughs> and it, therefore, it's, and you've used credit cards. And it's at 70% utilization, or your current, today's balance is at $7,000. That's 70% utilization. And that would absolutely disqualify you today from going through the program because as I said earlier, you need to be at 30%. So what to do? Well, you can rob, rob your own bank account and or try and find funds to pay down your card so we can get you into this program or depending, we will take a look at the account <clears throat> and likely lend you the money so that you can pay down your credit cards and over a 30 day period of time, your FICO score will go through the moon and you'll end up with a FICO score above 700 once those payments have reflected and you've got your utilization ratios down into the conformity of 30% or less. This is a great program and an excellent way for us to be able to uh, work with individuals. The other question people oftentimes disqualify themselves on, Michael, is they say, well, um, my situation's different. I had 
some, you know, I had, I, I, I had a, uh, a, a bankruptcy. I had a, uh, a charge off. I had, uh, I have a lien. And those are still on my credit report because credit reports reflect information in most cases for seven years and in certain cases up to 10 years. Now, it was in my past, but it's affecting my FICO. Let me say that we have an attorney that we work with. I used to own a licensed and bonded credit repair company, and, I, and there are no exacts or guarantees uh, in credit repair because you can't make them. However, I've never seen an individual have more successes consistently removing inquiries and bankruptcies and any types of derogatories that there could collections and charge offs. Uh, the attorney that we work with is magical. She's very inexpensive. And that's the other way that we can go about increasing your uh, credit scores so that we get you to where you need to be to go through the program where the average client gets funded seventy-five to eighty thousand dollars in a matter of weeks from the time that we get them put through, as much as one hundred and fifty thousand dollars on a first round, and then we can come back and do a second round months later where we can pick up as much as another hundred thousand. So this program can get over a period of time an individual as much as two hundred and fifty plus thousand dollars we've seen this time in and time again great. and it's a so, great great program that sounds extraordinary yeah i mean that's really going to move the needle because the people who, if you're selling i don't know let's say you're selling um half a million a month or something you want to expand you need you're needing to look at numbers in, in in the hundreds of thousands so that would actually really move the needle so that's pretty significant result to say the least so let me just reflect again just go back yes. over what i've heard just to make sure that i've understood and that's the and then we'll the move business. on to the the other uh funding program that we've got and want to share that with you as well but fear please. not we will cover everything <laughs> but i just want to make sure that people can absorb this because i was fine with it with um, anything technical certainly with internet marketing stuff it's familiar to me from that now and whenever i go out with somebody new however bright they are it's just you forget oh my god this is a steep learning curve so let me just revol re reflect so broadly please. speaking we're looking at revolving lines of credit so the difference yes. between that and the term loan i guess is you, you you take some money out you pay some back you keep taking some out again you, you go back and forth so the, the crucial thing is the FICO right. score. First, first question, just remind us what FICO stands for or means, especially for the non-Americans amongst us. Uh, it's the Fair Isaacs, oh my gosh. It doesn't uh, matter. I mean, like you don't need to remember uh, what it sounds like. Exactly. Yeah, blah, but blah, it's blah. Basically, it's basically your credit score, right? It's not, not anything it's your, that. It's the American uh, credit score. There are many, many different models. There's the Vantage score. There's the this score. There's the that score. Hmm. Uh, but it is your... A score from the three different bureaus, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian, and and that is your the credit score that one has. Okay, so broadly speaking, to put it in simple terms, it's kind of your Experian credit score, um, but obviously not just Experian. But okay, fine. So yeah, very interesting what you were saying about the. Um, the credit card thing. I mean, it reminds me actually of, of the old advice about speakers. Like if you want to have a really good quality speakers at a, at a concert, because my background as a musician, I've done the odd sort of gigs like that. And most of it was classical piano. But so if you've got a, a massive amp system and you only use a certain percentage of that power, you get a very good quality experience. Whereas if you're running it right to the, the it's like redlining a car, you're going to damage things quite quickly. I guess that's a probably a better analogy, right? So it sounds like what we, what we need broadly is high credit limits and then a modest utilization of them at any given point is that is that a fair summary it's a very fair summary and i really like the analogy uh fico and the credit the credit scoring companies uh get very concerned once you have high utilization that uh, you're going to blow yourself up get major distortion and not uh, be a good pay because there's too much financial pressure on you which is why they start to erode your score once you get over 30% utilization. And we happen to have a fix for it. Like I said, we can lend clients the money to pay down their cards so that their scores will uh, zoom up so that they are not affecting uh, their current business. Uh, it's a solution and it's been a, a, a really, really good workaround, but I, I couldn't agree with you more, Michael. That's a, a very good analogy.
Well, that's very flattering of you. But I mean, I was thinking also it's a bit more, I mean, more realistic. It's a bit more like um, a car where if you're redlining it all the time, you're just going to shorten the life of the the car. It's going to be an unpleasant, bumpy ride. Any passenger you got with you aren't like, if you're a professional taxi driver, you wouldn't get your aren't people coming back. And I guess if we treat the lenders as a core part of the business, which I think we kind of need to because the money is so critical, then we've got to give the lenders the kind of ride that they want, right? And if they want to feel like you're, you're going along, your car could do 7,000 revs per minute, but you're going along at 1500 smoothly cruising along and that they keeps them happy then that's i guess a mentality again that we have to adjust to in our business and again it's almost like a mentality shift for amazon sellers or any entrepreneurs because we tend to be pedal to the metal as you would say it's another car metaphor and we tend to want to rev everything to the max we burn ourselves out into working 16 hour days we put all the money in we mortgage our house whatever but suddenly we have to kind of be aware of a different mentality in relation to money with the lenders it seems to me so it's not just mechanics it's also more like a, a mind shift that we understand people come with quite a different mindset where actually burning the midnight oil is not always good. I would totally agree with you. Would you mind if I shared, uh, uh, just going on that and taking that a little bit further, would you mind if I share uh, a strategy that's going to help your clients not burn themselves out on their FICO? Yeah, sure, of course. Okay. So there are some new, newer scoring models that some of the uh, credit grantors are adapting. And in those new scoring models, they are actually tracking the amount of utilization that clients are keeping themselves at chronically, and they're getting penalized if they're consistently uh, revving, as you said, or redlining, and always at a high limit. Now again, I told you you can pay down your you can pay down your cards and your score is going to go up. But with some of these new models, if you're chronically redlining, redlining, redlining month in month out, that can have a damaging effect long term to your FICO. So one of the things, and my tip is pretty simple. My tip is get business cards that don't and because all business cards but with one exception do not do not report on your fico so if you want to rev and do the red line which i totally get let's do it strategically let's do it with business cards that don't report on your fico keep those utilization ratios up at 60 70 80 or 90% and it will not affect your credit score at all. And conversely, try and keep your personal cards at 30% or lower as much of the time as possible, and you're gonna end up having the best of both worlds. Nice, now, so basically you have next a- Next pardon? Okay. I'm just gonna double check, sorry to interrupt. I just wanna just reflect sure. back, just make sure that everyone's got a chance to absorb this stuff, because I mean, some people might say, yeah, yeah it's obvious, but a lot of people are going, whoa, let me just get the, my head around this. So basically a business card as in the card in the name of your business your llc or whatever the the yep. entity is um, yes. you can basically redline those with some degree of impunity i.e the fica score will not be badly affected but any yes. personal cards you basically keep below 30 percent utilization and then you're safe is that is that a fair summary in a perfect world right. that is apps that is absolutely the case yeah. which begs the question when we work with people not only do we give them this, this education, but we go one step further. Many of the clients that we work with, even though they're in business, they may not have a business entity. And one of the things that we can do and one of the things that we, we help with is getting them an entity so that we can get them the business cards that are attached to the entity so that they can redline all they want on those business cards, <laughs> which right. by the way, also usually get approved at a 10 to 15 percent higher straight across the board um, uh, open to buy or credit limit so it that there's a secondary reason that we love to go after those business cards okay yeah so higher higher credit limit um okay makes a lot of sense so um thank you for for letting me sort of reflect back on that i just want to make sure we can absorb this and sort of Absorbable chunks. <laughs> so that's uh, the revolving. So that would would that be the revolving lines of credit program that you then offer? That, that's yes, that that really that really summarizes uh, 
uh, the revolving lines of uh, credit program that we've got. Uh -huh. Super smart. Okay. Super smart. That's so American. I mean, because so many Americans are becoming Americanized here. But that is very smart. I, I love the fact that you know where the, the red lines are, if you like, or, or the do not cross lines are, and you just step carefully around those and, and maintain that pressure score. So it's just like Amazon ranking. It's just the same kind of mentality, actually. It's like, whatever you do, you look after the ranking and that, that kind of then everything else good flows from that, it seems. So um, so you talked about revolving lines of credit. Do you have other forms of credit that you would um, educate people in or help people get or that people can generally go for? There are two that uh, I think are important uh, to the FBA uh, sellers that are uh, on this call. One of which is our term loan program. And the term loan program uh, is unusual in as much as we have a platform where we have 25 lenders on that platform. Now imagine, if you will, if you went to 25 lenders uh, individually, what would happen? Well, your credit would be destroyed. And the reason is, is you would have 25 inquiries uh, on your FICO, uh, which of course is going to really hurt uh, your score and have a dramatic negative effect uh, if other people see that you are, have applied for that many uh, uh, different credit uh, or, or for that much credit with different uh, lenders. So what we've done is we've consolidated and put all these lenders into one place and with one inquiry, actually with no inquiries, with a soft inquiry, which means it does not show up on your report, with one soft inquiry, we go out and spider out to these lenders and we get within a 30 to 45 second period of time, well, we either get no offers or we get offers and we can get multiple offers from one lender. And oftentimes we get multiple offers from multiple lenders. Uh, the APRs here start at 4.9% and go up accordingly from there, depending uh, on the individual's credit. Uh, we would like to see that they are employed and that they do have a provable income, either W-2 income or 1099 income, uh, and that money's flowing into uh, their personal banking bank account. Again, our consultants go through all this uh, with, with the individual. But the beauty is there are no hard inquiries unless – you see a loan that's on the platform or multiple loans that are on the platform and you want to uh, go forward. At that time prior to or when you go into the final underwriting stages before they, uh, they, they send you the money and put it into your bank account, yes, there will be a hard inquiry, but we've limited that to only the, the lenders that you like what they've got to offer and that have actually made you an offer in the first place. So it's a great, great program. Uh, it only takes a few minutes. It's an online process uh, and very, very easy. And we can take people with FICO scores as low as a 580. And 580, if you, if you have a 580, uh, uh, then you know you have multiple credit derogatories. Now, I'm not telling you that you're going to get approved uh, if you've got a 580, but I am here to say that we've had people that have had as low as a 580 FICO score get some approvals for some amounts of money. Nice. The higher the FICO, of course, the more you're going to get approved for. And these loans, we, uh, you put in how much you want, but we have loans that range starting with $1,000, and going up on the other hand to $50,000. And more good news, you can take, as I was saying, multiple offers. So let's just say you wanted a lot of inventory. Uh, you could put in for $50,000 and take, say, two offers and parlay that right to $100,000 right there and then. So it's a, a great program. Uh, we've had tremendous success, and it's a win-win. That sounds like a, a, a very, again, super smart. Uh, I'm using the terribly American language. So why not? What the hell? I'm speaking to Americans. Super smart. Very, very smart in the sense that you understand exactly how the system works. So 
the soft inquiry is basically a bit like me saying to somebody, instead of making um, a job offer or something to somebody, say, look, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that this is available, but if you were free, w would you be free on Saturday? You know, so I've done that in the past when I was an orchestral um, conductor I'd, and fixing orchestras. I would say, listen, this isn't a job offer because then it's a contractual thing and that goes into all sorts of trouble if you renege on it. But it's basically that soft inquiry thing is very, very smart. And it makes total sense to me immediately if you don't trigger an official thing. But unofficially, you're basically saying, look, I'm not actually asking for a loan. But look, if I were to ask you for a loan, would you say yes? It seems very British as well, if I may say so. That That's a very British way of looking at things. So like, well, you know, we're just going to float the possibility past you here. So I love that. Um, I love the fact that it works so well for you. And obviously the FICO score... Um, that you can deal with is, you know, as you say, no guarantees, but it's very worth inquiring for people who've had quite a lot of credit issues. The other question then, apart from the fact that you could get up to $100,000, which again would move the needle, particularly if you've got something in Q4, you've got to get some some inventory now and, and um, you're going to have to order it maybe in September or even August or something to get it in, or maybe even earlier. And then the payoff won't go through to January. This brings you to the other question is, is what kind of term loans are we looking at? I mean, we're talking about a few months or years or what sort of duration? The term loans, that's a, a, another good question. The term loans vary in length as little as 12 months and as long as 60 months, uh, which is five years. So uh, okay. we've got everything. And, and when I said uh, earlier, you'll get pot potentially uh, uh, multiple offers from each uh, lender or for, from uh, more than from lenders, uh, they will sometimes make an offer for a 24 month loan at X APR and Y payment, and one for 36 months and one for 48 months, and they may even make a 60 month offer. So okay. it's so all dependent long. upon the lender. Yeah, okay, excellent. So now one of the questions I wanted to ask about that, they want to see is it a W10 or a 1099? These are not familiar with me, but, but they would be to American listeners, I guess. So. And they want to see some income from employment. Now, um, what, if you're a serious um, Amazon business owner, then presumably your employment is going to be through your Amazon company. So is there an issue if your employment income is coming from the same basic source? No, Amazon, not at all. Else, that's okay, is it? Right. No, that's okay. And it likely it would be a 1099 income if that would be the case. Uh, W-2 income is usually relegated to people who are working for another employer and then they get their W-2 income and they get their pay stubs and, and so on and so forth. So if you're because getting a direct to people are just getting into their FBA selling mm -hmm. and maybe they're not full time and blah, 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 so on and okay. so forth. So you can handle both situations. So the W-2 sure. is basically for the person who's got a day job and running their business, their Amazon business evenings, weekends. And then the, the 1099 would be maybe if you're a director of a company receiving a salary or something like that. Um, if you're a director of a company, uh, you're probably still a W-2. Usually okay. 1099 income uh, is, is relegated to people who are solopreneurs and have their own company. Okay, so if you're a direct, what I meant by director of a company is if you are basically you're the owner or, or you know significant yes. owner of yes, I'm an so Amazon sorry. based business. No, that's fine. I mean, this is why it's worth digging around into these details because obviously the devil is often in the detail. So if you're like a solopreneur and you own 100% of the business, then that's one thing. But if you, for example, if you are the managing director or the CEO, depending on which side of the pond you're on, um, of a company that also has a couple of other investors in it or something like that, and you're getting paid a director's salary, then that would still be okay within the auspices of this program is what I'm basically asking. In most cases, I would say yes. Fine. We need to look at the uh, look at the situation. And it's just a question of uh, us being able to derive and source the income. And if everything lines up, we are good to go. Great. Really just a quick sort of sanity check that they didn't require somebody to be you know, having a day job that is off Amazon or something. Right. Okay. Absolutely it's not. Cool. All right. So that sounds very, very powerful, obviously. Um, again, this, this fintech pro platform sounds an extraordinarily quick and efficient way of bypassing an awful lot of problems. Um, so very clever stuff. Um, what other kinds of credit, if, if any, do you offer? So we talked about uh, revolving lines of credit. Which, with, we talked about trade lines that you then parlay into credit lines, uh, credit cards. And that was um, potentially available to, um, if, I'm, if I'm right, then th those are potentially available to, th those are the ones that are available to domestic or US-based people. And then the term loan program, again, that's a domestic one. And then, uh, yeah, for US-based or domestic lending, are there any other possibilities? Yes, there is. Now, many of the people who are on the call that are domestic here in the United States, 
uh, and are either um, they worked for uh, an employer where they uh, received or are still receiving a or are participating in a 401k or IRA, uh, an investment retirement account, uh, they could potentially move those funds. And when I say potentially, let me, let me clarify and then have the ability to use those funds for anything that they wanted that was of a business uh, nature. So first of all, uh, with our BDRA, which is our business directed retirement account, you must have rollable funds. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're currently working for uh, an employer and you're participating in their 401k or their IRA, however, you used to work for another company and you took a chunk of money, 50, 100, or more thousand dollars and moved it over to your existing company, IRA or 401k, you can actually carve out that money that you brought from the previous employer and roll it over into a very specialized type of self-directed account that we can get you involved with, which is called the BDRA or Business Directed Retirement Account. Likely, you won't be able to move your 401k or IRA from the present employer because they usually have a stipulation that says, as long as you're employed here, you can participate, but you cannot, meaning you can invest. We'll put a certain amount of your paycheck in there for you that's tax deferred, but you cannot take the money. Now, the day they quit or retire, as the case may be, uh, at that particular point, then that 401k and or IRA monies is accessible from their current or now becomes their past employer. The right, problem okay. with, with most of these IRA and or 401k self-directed uh, companies that are competitors of ours is they have what's called a very narrow, narrowly defined focus, very narrowly defined focus of what you can use the funds for. You can use the funds for real estate investing and for securities investing and these types of things. And that's pretty much it. Um, you certainly cannot be using it for buying goods uh, on Amazon. However, a BDRA, that business directed retirement account, is hugely successful based upon its flexibility when in use. You can use the funds for any business purpose whatsoever. Obviously, encapsulated in that statement would be utilizing those funds for making purchases to fuel your business with uh, Amazon. So if you have a 401k or an IRA and it's rollable, uh, you definitely uh, uh, need to look into this BDRA. It's phenomenal, it works, and we've been able to ha uh, have clients of ours get access to, in certain cases, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars that they couldn't have previously because it was uh, unattainable and or not usable because of the rules of the road. Amazing. So that's could be potentially a very, very powerful thing indeed. So let me just double check, sort of sanity check. Um, well, first of all, what it is. So basically you need to have a 401k or IRA that is rollable. And that basically happens because you've changed employer at some point, which could include obviously the lovely situation where you go to your boss, say, I quit my day job in order to focus on my Amazon business. And by the way, that means a bunch of funds become rollable at that point, if I understand. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that you offer, as opposed to most people's, um, is that the there's a narrowly defined focus of what you can use that money for, um, whereas a BDRA is very much more flexible, and that means you can use it for stock or you know advertising or whatever else, I guess. So, um, is that an accurate summary? First of all, and then I've got a couple of questions. Yes. Excellent. Good. So I'm, I'm getting here. Some good students. I'm learning Americans' um, financial situation here. Um, 
And uh, this is all part of the joy of being an internet marketer. You constantly have to expand your your sphere of knowledge, which I find very, very interesting. So hopefully listeners are finding it interesting as well. Um, the other question then is, obviously, we're dealing with somebody's pension. Um, that sounds to me that it's something, obviously, just like putting your house on the line or, you know, or, or any other real estate uh, for a business sounds like something to be treated with caution. Are there sort of downsides that we need to be aware of here that could affect your pension in the future? Well, the the notion of an IRA or a 401k is it's going to be for retirement funds. Um, and if you were to take those funds out without, uh, a, 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 with, without rolling them over, you'd be subjected to, first of all, a 10% penalty on all the funds. And you would also incur the ordinary income uh, in w the year that you took those funds out, which if you took a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars out, and you were at uh, a forty-three percent tax bite, which you could be in the United States, obviously, and then the ten percent penalty, half your funds just went goodbye. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So okay. that ain't pr that ain't pretty. Uh, on the other hand, I always tell people, look, the IRA. The 401k monies that are there, even coupled with your social security, are likely not going to get you the retirement to even keep you close to the lifestyle that you've enjoyed during your working life. You need to make an eyes, both open decision if this makes sense for you. Now, if you are looking at making home run deals like so many of the Amazon sellers that I've seen, of course it makes sense. And or if you're looking to have access and control the destiny of your, of your future because you know that you need to make more money with that money that is available to you for the days that you're going to retire, then a BDRA certainly makes more sense. Okay, it if, makes a lot of sense, actually. And, yeah. and, and, and frankly, if, if you feel, rightfully or wrongfully, that by leaving the money there, um, then you're going to at least have something, um, then likely making that move might not be the right thing for you. I cannot make that decision for an individual I can only tell you that many individuals who have made that move and accessed that money have been able to parlay that money into five and 10 and 20 and 50 X of the monies that they had in the first place. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, from what you're saying is it really drawing back out from the business, um, even just thinking in terms of not just e-commerce, but business as a whole, but just drawing further back to the investment 100,000 foot view, if you like. I mean, it comes down to asset allocation, right? So yes. it might make sense to have some of your stuff. If it's not rollable, presumably if you've got um, hundred thousand dollars in rollable funds and maybe half a million in non-rollable funds that's just parked in safe, boring investments anyway. So it's a question of how much of your, um, assets do you allocate to a high risk high reward thing like business and particularly amazon I mean, it's very very high reward if you get it right but like any business venture is, is risk right so i guess it comes down and to it, a personal and, financial decision right and michael if, if anybody i don't know uh uh if a lot of your uh folks that are listeners and or viewers are are uh looking at uh the stock market Stock are, uh, the stock market ain't that safe of a haven. Uh, we've, we've, had, we've had a year uh, in this calendar year where people, in most cases, uh, have lost money. So just leaving it parked where it is, uh, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it might not be a good thing. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you're losing money, and you're not even gaining money, well then when you factor in, in uh, inflation, cost of uh, uh, a living increases, then you're really getting behind the eight ball in a, in a very unfavorable way. So again, the choice is up to the individual um, and it, it really just depends on, on risk tolerance, what the final uh, uh, goals are, and we're here to help 
if it makes sense for you. That makes a lot of sense. Yes, of course. I mean, it's risk tolerance. Yeah, is is ultimately the thing one has to have as an entrepreneur, and and that balance of risk reward and having an aggressive but not you know self destructive level of risk tolerance. I guess, and that's it's a very personal thing, as you say. So just coming back to one little issue that you raised, just want to dig bottom this out, as they say. Um, if it's not rollable, you get a 10% penalty of all the funds, plus you get taxed on massive income tax bills. So that's not good. So neither is the case with the BDRA. Is that right? Just to clarify that. With the BDRA, because it, uh, all of the money uh, that, uh, that the person is going to be utilizing becomes deferred until you're 70 and a half, the answer is, is, is no. Uh, you're, you're deferring it out just like you would uh, with your normal uh, self-directed or your normal 401k or IRA uh, that uh, you don't get taxed on until you have to take taxable distributions at 70 and a half. Okay, so, so basically you will better, get taxed, but down the line and only on the income. Way level. down the line, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And they okay. wouldn't also be subjected to that 10% uh, uh, penalty for blowing it all up in the first place. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is, if you're going to use your pension at all, it sounds like the only same way to do it is the BDRA. And then it comes down to an asset allocation decision really, doesn't it? I mean, you know, some of it in apparently safe things, I take your point about stocks. I mean, yeah, this, this is to be uh, taken with a pinch of salt, whether they're even safe and, and bonds, which are an interesting one with all the, com all the uh, countries in the world, USA, UK, EU, Japan now as well, doing um, quantitative easing, then, then bonds are also not the greatest investment right, right now. But yes, it's a question of al asset allocation and ultimately risk tolerance. So yeah, that's just for people to decide for themselves. But it does sound like if you're going to do it at all, this is a, a very smart way of doing it. So look, um, this is all very, very interesting stuff. And it's certainly, if nothing else, eye-opening. I and mean, I think um, I would say to any British listeners, I hope you've stuck with it so far, because whenever whatever happens in America tends to come over to the UK in the next few years. Uh, so even if stuff like this isn't happening here yet, I got a feeling that those things may well be happening and there'll, there'll be equivalents. And if not, they'll start to open up. But also for the American listeners and your domestic listeners, there's obviously a ton of different stuff that you guys offer that's very powerful, very savvy. You really know how the system works. So you're working around it in a very elegant way. Um, how do people get in touch or, or apply or just find out more about this stuff, Bruce? Oh, that's a great question. And, and thank you very much for opening, that, uh, opening up that door. Uh, first of all, uh, people can email me at any time, uh, and my direct email address is Bruce, B-R-U-C-E, at the at sign, Platinum, P-L-A-T-I-N-U-M, Financing Group, F-I-N-A-N-C-I-N-G, Group, G-R-O-U-P. Now, I'm asked constantly. Is that dot com, by the there? way? Sorry. Yes, dot com, yes. Dot com, yeah. There are two G's there. So it's Bruce at Platinum Financing Group dot com. Yeah. Likewise, feel free, uh, pick up the phone, give me a call. I'll give you my direct no uh, number. Uh, my direct number is 702 area code yeah. 371 yep. Again. My direct line is 702-371-2345. Just a little heads up, I'm on the West Coast in California. So for people who are in different time zone and meridians, I generally get in the uh, office uh, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. I know that sounds late, but I'm also usually in the office till 10, 11, 12 o'clock. Uh, feel free to give me a call anytime between nine o'clock and seven o'clock uh, uh, California time. That should be plenty of a, a good chunk of a window to get in touch with me and or uh, feel free to text message me should you wish to. But uh, email is a, a great way to get started. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll get back to you and, and delve into your specific issues and we'll try and solve them and get you as much money and uh, funding as uh, as you're looking for to achieve. Amazing. So yeah, that's that's delightfully um, traditional. By the way, I like. It. I mean, it's, it's not a criticism. I like it. it's email or call me. And by the way, folks, we will be putting um, a, a sort of prelude to this in the. Um, 
uh, in the uh, what am I trying to say in the audio is what I'm trying to say in the podcast so we'll get that at the beginning and end so if you missed that number don't panic we'll put um, a link uh, to some show notes where you can get all those details from Bruce and all the explanations of what we've gone over today as well in summary as well so panic not we will get you the information if you want to get in touch uh, with Bruce so Bruce just a um, um, couple of things to ask I me mean, first of all thank you so much for uh, sharing a lot of wisdom but can you give us any last sort of summary advice to specifically e-commerce sellers uh, regarding funding as sort of if you had to sort of give them two or three bits of general advice what would they be I'm gonna keep it very 20,000 foot if I if, if you don't mind please do and I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna kind of widen this to any business and this sort of goes back to the discussion that we were having just a few minutes ago, uh, utilizing IRA or 401k funds, and that's this. To do nothing is to get you nothing. The sum total is going to be, if you are inactive and not moving forward, I can guarantee you that things are not going to change and they're gonna stay very much the same. Likewise, if you put your foot in forward and your next foot forward and your next foot forward and you create vision and goals and expectations and you start to move towards those you're going to get a result as long as you give some forethought and some planning that result likely will be beyond your wildest dreams as it has for so many of my clients locally, nationally, as well as internationally. So I only want to wish you the very, very best. I'd love to be able to work with you. I'd love to be able to see you take the next step towards the success that you can, should, and will achieve. Wow, excellent. That's quite the sign off as proper California based big picture, you know, um, positive thinking. I like it very much. So, Bruce, thank you so much for clarifying so much of the, the sort of mysteries of funding and giving us some very interesting options to chew on. And in some cases, I hope, as you said, to do nothing is to get nothing. Absolutely. I hope that people will, at the very, very least, explore things as they got the flavor of who you are and you're not going to be. Um, trying to sell them a used car, you're going to explore it together. And I think that's always the thing that I would advise anyone to do. If in doubt, find out. And then if it's not for you, that's fine. You haven't wasted much time, but it could be the answer. And I certainly know that the funding question isn't going to go away. The more ambitious you are, 100% sure that the more you're going to need to raise funds. So this is something that's not going to go away. Um, very, very helpful. Bruce, thank you so much for coming on to share your um, wisdom and insights and, and to share what your company does for people. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for having me on your show. Uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, and uh, again, um, it's just been, it's been a wonderful experience. And, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.